what I want to tell uh, everybody, first of all, is that essentially the budget targets for this year, we talked about 1%. But that was a 1% after we made adjustments to reduce the budgets to back out PERS increase, our PERS de cost decreases from uh, PERS reform legislation. And um, we had previously included but not funded a COLA. So remember last year we didn't provide any uh, cost of living raise for managers and confidential employees. That included the sheriff's office. So you all saw the budget targets when we set them in December. But just to kind of refresh your memory, uh, in 13-14, the sheriff's uh, budget target was $21,216,531. This year, the budgeted amount is $20,857,000. So you see almost a, you know, um, $800,000 reduction in cost to the sheriff budget. So we reduced their budget by that amount. That included the 1% general fund increase after we backed out those adjustments. Though, okay? So the sheriff came in under his budget target slightly um, for everything except for emergency management. We moved emergency management from county administration, the position FTE, not authority for the program, which stays at the county administrator, but where it's housed and uh, the staff conducts the, uh, the program is in the sheriff's budget. Just so you know, we're talking uh, uh, small uh, increments of over the budget target. For emergency management, they came in $2,800 over. But for their overall budget target, they came in $7,800 under. So they're under their budget target by $5,000. And that's with an $800,000 reduction in cost for the services um, to the general fund. Thanks, Harvey. Um, we had adopted in their budget last year 161.35 FTE. Through the year, the revised FTE number is 167.35. That's specific to additional positions we added, which will contribute to uh, our ability to open the additional beds that we built. Um, now, we had some questions from the public about why are we adding FTE in the sheriff's budget. We added five positions, which cost us, you know, roughly $500,000, but we generated $1.2 million in revenue. And you'll see that on the revenue because we're able to lease out uh, beds to the federal government. We're at 23, I think now, 25 roughly. I mean, it changes daily. But we have 60 beds. So we were able to increase our own capacity for the county without raising taxes or finding other general fund revenues by doing it this way. That was proposed by me and the sheriff two years back or three years back when we said, if we do this, we believe we actually can increase capacity and reduce cost to the general fund. So now you're seeing the cost reduction of the general fund of 800,000 and you'll see on the revenues for uh, jail bed rentals to uh, 1.2 million in revenue roughly. However, what the sheriff did between the revised budget where we added, went from 161.35 to 167.35, is this proposed, our department requested, and my recommended budget actually reduces the FTE back down to 163.3. So essentially, from last year to this year, once the budgets are accounted for, we'll have only increased two FTE in the Sheriff's Department. We'll have opened those 60 jail beds. We'll have generated another 1.2 million in revenue from jail bed rentals uh, and reduced the burden on the general fund, $800,000. So it's really kind of an amazing feat by the Sheriff's Department and his staff working with us to do this. Those contracts are in place. Um, they're already being utilized. The jail beds are already being utilized. And we anticipate an actual increase in those revenues because of some structural uh, work the Sheriff's doing with all of the uh, federal and state agencies to bring uh, additional uh, capacity potentially. One other thing I want to mention about the jail beds is there'll be an additional reduction to the general fund that will come by way of community justice because what we did on in their budget, which you all realize that a portion of their budget funds the sheriff's department for the impact for people that are sentenced locally that the state funds through community justice and then they receive a transfer of revenue to help fund those. In the community justice side, we received funding for two years, which is meant to reduce 
the state prison population, keep more people locally. And what we did, which is unique in the state, is we reached out to Josephine, Lane, Klamath, Lake, maybe Curry, we're not sure if Curry, Goose County, or Pittsburgh, and create a program with our additional jail capacity that other counties can't do because one, they don't have the capacity, and two, they don't have the money. And create a program where they can actually rent and just like other counties rent jail beds from other counties, rent beds to put people into the program. And I'm anticipating in the community justice budget that will be about a quarter of a million dollars in revenue. That will offset general fund expenditure by that same amount. So instead of, and you'll see that when we get to community justice's budget, but it's working with the sheriff's office that, you know, those two working together to manage that jail population that has caused that. So it's not reflected in the sheriff's budget, but I want to make sure you, you understand it requires some coordination between the sheriff's budget and that program. The other issue in the sheriff's budget is they've created a new program, although it's not new staff or anything like that. They've essentially reorganized to create a support services program, and so they've centralized their support services more so than having them dispersed throughout each of the programs. It's not an additional cost. It's a structural change, uh, per se. And um, I mean, frankly, I don't. The, any issues that I had while we were preparing the budget have been worked out to the point where the way the budget sits, with maybe some minor changes, um, will be the budget that you'll see that I would recommend to the budget committee uh, when we get there. Um, and uh, I think that's probably a pretty good calculation, is it? Well, so we, we typically wouldn't talk about this issue in, in general session, so I'm going to, uh, because it's an executive session issue regarding labor negotiations, we are in labor negotiations again. You'll recall that we went through arbitration with the Sheriff's Union, which just ended last year, but it was two years into a three-year contract when it ended, so we're back in negotiations uh, now, and uh, the budget target and um, what we agreed to in executive session for fiduciary is all that we have on our side to offer. If for some reason we go to arbitration and uh, we don't prevail, that will have to be managed within the sheriff's budget targets and the amount in fiduciary for funding that. That's pretty much been the budget committee's position in the past is we're going to make a fair offer based on what the law requires us. And remember, for strike bar units, the law specifies how you have to provide compensation. And um, so, so we are doing that. One thing that I want you all to know with regard to that is the law also identifies what compensation is. And um, there's the issue of being comparable, and it's specific in law how we have to compare to other counties just for this union and also the parole union, because they're the two strike bar prohibited unions. Um, but there's also the cost or, or the issue of um, your ability to, to afford what that package is. So in the past, um, and, and honestly, I don't know if any other city or county does this. In fact, I don't think they do. But it's something that I think is important that we do to represent the true cost, total employers, full cost of compensation is while we look at things like salary and benefits and all of those types of things, when we give a salary increase, we have additional costs that aren't considered in the comparables for compensation, like the incremental cost of funding PERS and the unfunded PERS actuarial liability. We have the cost of funding uh, 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 sick leave and comp leave and vacation leave banks, because that incremental cost for whatever's on the books goes up. Uh, and that goes up for the period of the contract. The cost of life insurance that's provided uh, to employees, premiums goes up because there is an additional salary component. All of those aren't considered in the, in the cost of compensation for the purposes of arbitration, but they are for the purposes of our ability to afford. So while in, in my whole career, I've not known of any other place that's done that, we are getting fairly uh, uh, detail on making sure we account for those costs, not because they're going to make a difference in how the arbitrator compares our compensation, but they're going to make a difference in how we explain our ability to pay for or for. So uh, probably more than you needed to know about that, but I wanted you all to know that we're certainly paying attention to, to those details, um, and we'll make them uh, at least apparent 
uh, in the negotiation process. And um, so, is there a, a, anything else you, Harvey? Is there anything else I missed? <laughs> I mean, gosh, thank you, Harvey. Yeah. <coughs> I have a question. Uh, so, you, you just, the, the total FTE is just two a bit more than we had last year, correct? It, it goes from 161.35 to 163.3, so 1.95. But we've revised the budget this year, so they're actually at 167.35 right now. So he's actually cutting from where he is right now more than he's adding from where we started the budget, but he's cutting from the changes we've made. Okay. Okay. I just want, but we you had to hire additional uh, deputies in the, in the, in the beds, the additional beds on there. So we're so obviously you need some reductions in other parts of the budget. Like that. How'd you do that? So you know, that you yeah, we realized we had several missing things and so we can to reduce for security by um, our position. We had some clerical positions that we didn't fill that we eliminated for the next budget. And I believe probably most of those were just due to retirements and the country spoke that they were making needs. And one of those additional FT is actually the emergency management program transferring yes. into their budget. So it's 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 not and it's net not an additional FT to the county because you're going to see the reduction of the FT in my budget. So it, it really isn't even it's like 0.95. Yeah. Well, again, I don't have any problem with that. I'm just wondering where the, where the other cuts were made to, to do that because one would have just assumed that an additional uh, bodies in the jail. Are we open for questions? Or? Yes, sir. I have three, and I could probably cover them. But every year we talk about the traffic deputies and the amount of fines and the effects of the court. Could you address that a little bit? And I'm curious how much we spend on jail medical. Okay. And the other one is how many unfilled positions do we have today? that we have not filled in the budget? Well, or the let, actual, let, me, let me start with I'm not sure how to phrase that. Last year's actual or this year's budget or something. Okay, I think that was actually four questions. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the first question, again, please. The first question. Can you repeat it, the first question? Well, the first question, just a little conversation about the amount of the deputies on the traffic squad still dedicated to that and what we expect in the way of fines and so forth. So we had anticipated, remember this is, it, it comes in their budget via general fund contribution, but the way the general fund receives that money is from the Justice Court. So right. it's technically a Justice Court question budget you're asking. Yeah. But you'll remember we went through a tough situation with the state changing law and essentially doing a money grab. We fought hard to get to get it back to the way that it was. They did change the law essentially back to the way it was, but there was a lag time between when the law was changed and when it took effect of about six months. So we saw a continual decline for that. And I had projected somewhere between five hundred to seven hundred fifty thousand dollars shortfall in what the revenue should have been before the law changed versus after it changed. The law did get changed and essentially what we did in the Justice Court budget is projected almost half a million dollars more in revenue than we would have actually seen this year. So because we were able to change the law back, we were able to cover that amount. And in, in fact, you'll see the contribution of revenue in the Justice Court increase from last year. Um, and uh, in terms of the traffic team's portion of that, remember, when we created the traffic team, there was already contributions from the Justice Court to the general fund. And what we said was, you don't get credit for what was already coming in, sheriff and traffic team. You get credit from there on. And so essentially, you know, the traffic team roughly is around a million dollar budget. The majority of that is covered by the general fund contribution that is realized from the Justice Court revenue to the general fund, although they do have a couple of grants. I think they have a seatbelt enforcement grant, and there's one more you have. Yeah, seatbelt, speeding. And DUI. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, but they're they're covering the cost of the drive. I mean, that's covering the cost of the driving team, the, the Justice Court. It wasn't netting 
an inc uh, a revenue to the general fund because of those state law changes, but because we got it fixed, now it is. Yeah, didn't we have a little problem with dedication of the deputies to the job that the got corrected to? They, they have gone through changes in who is managing the program and who's assigned to it, and yeah, there's not an issue with it there. I mean, those, those deputies are essentially dedicated to traffic. Now, if there's an emergency, you know, then they're, they're not. But, but not a continuing or not. No, I think the sheriff's done also an amazing job managing that program. And any time there's kind of a little blip in it, they get in and deal with it as quick as they can. So the shortfall will show up in this fiscal year, not in the budget. I actually year. think we'll still be good. And I kind of explained this in December, but I'll revisit it a little bit. I think we'll be good because there were two months, maybe even three, two and a half or three months, where they uh, exceeded what we had budgeted for, what we expected the citations to be. There were several months where they didn't, but there were, and so when we made the projections, it was on the several months they didn't, but then we had two or three months where they exceeded that, and so it balanced, essentially balanced out, even with the loss of revenue. Had the state not changed the law and essentially done a money grab, we would have saw a net gain in revenue. Um, with regard to um, uh, your second question, which was, I believe, the jail medical issue, that's actually a human services budget. Well, that's moved over now. It's always managed out of their budget because they manage public health and nurses and the sheriff isn't, I mean, he knows a lot of stuff, but I don't know how much he knows about RNs and LPNs and nurse practitioners. Uh, so but that's actually managed through a contract with a, a private company called ComEd, who delivers the service on contract through human services. We have pre-negotiated uh, adjustments in the budget. We have outside medical cost allowance in that budget. If we under... Um, utilize the outside medical costs, then the county and ComEd split the savings, so there's incentive to them to, to do well that way. Um, if we over exceed, uh, over exceed the outside medical costs, we can have a consequence because of that. That is funded by all general fund, because human services can't pay for that. It's not a, a state funded service, it's a county mandated service. But uh, Mark's done a great job, and you'll see when he comes in, managing that with the sheriff, and Community Justice Talent Transition Center and the Juvenile Center. So it's not just the sheriff that's affected. But the end cost of that is not in the sheriff's budget, the no. contract cost? No, it's a direct general fund expenditure out of human services budget. Can I ask you why we changed that? It's always been like that. I thought we had it in the sheriff's budget. No. What used to happen is we used to manage it in-house where we had county employees. Yeah. But it was also still managed in human services. No, I, I, that budget target that we I'm not them, into the management. I was yeah. just wondering. I always thought, I thought the cost of it uh, was also the sheriff. The sheriff pays a portion. You know, a, a portion of the costs are attributable to the sheriff, but also a portion are attributable uh, to juvenile and the adult transitions. So and we have to provide medical services in all those places. I will tell you that this is probably a good thing. The legislature. I think we. In fact, I remember. 20 years ago being at the legislature testifying to try to say if someone has private insurance and they're in jail and they're not convicted and they require medical care that the private insurance should pay it. It hasn't been that way. The state finally did pass a law requiring that and the reason why we argued that is if they don't pay it, they're making money off of local governments and taxpayers for premiums that someone has paid them. And so that law changed. Now, we don't have a lot of people that come to jail with private insurance. But last, I think last year we would have had six of the cases that actually were outside medical care that would have you know, qualified for. But you know, even if it's $100,000, that's huge for us. Oh, yeah. So we are, we are using that as an opportunity to now renegotiate some of the terms of the contract. But this just passed. So I don't <coughs> really know the exact full financial impact for it yet. But I will. Shortly. And you had one more question, but do you remember what it was now? Does anyone else remember what is the other question? I think it was our vacancies. Yeah. Oh, vacancies. <laughs> okay. yeah. So the sheriff, the sheriff probably runs the one of the highest average vacancy rates, and the reason why is because their hiring process is fairly extensive. Um, I mean, it can take them nine months to a year to fill a, you know, a, a certified position. 
they have ran, you know, I mean, as high as 10%, as low as 3 or 4%. Um, so you look at the FTEs and do the percentages. Today, I don't know where that I could find out. It would need to go down to HR, and, um, see what recruitments and what sort of vacancies. Sometimes they purposely leave them vacant because they're going to cut them from their budget, like they are saying they're proposing here. So yeah, I don't have problem with that. But I mean, when we budget, it it seems like over time everybody likes to keep in the budget the FTE position, even though they may not fill it for one reason or another. We clean that up with the sheriff's budget for last year, last year, year, last year or the year before. Year before yeah. Last year. Yeah. Yeah. We cut. If I remember, ten. We had ten vacant FTEs in his budget, but to be honest with you, Dick, they were there but not funded, so there wasn't money with them. There was just position authority, and, and a lot of people we've been challenged publicly a lot. Well, you know, you did a supplemental budget to approve, you know, hiring people, and there's a public hearing requirement for that, and we hold a public hearing. But in Oregon budget laws, there's budget requirements, and then there's position authority, and they're two different things. So. You can approve the budget authority for positions, and then we've got to come back and get the approval for the FTE. I mean, they're two different things. And, uh, but, you know, the sheriff's done a good job managing that. He's not carrying like we were carrying them. The reason why we were carrying them before is because internally, and you, this will make sense to anyone who, you know, understands the administrative process, which should be everyone here, is we wanted the sheriff to have those positions to be able to have open recruitments. Because because he does run such a high vacancy rate, if we cut those positions out, then he then what it does is drop the bar. Now he has ten more open positions because of the length of time to recruitment. So we were leaving those positions there so he could actually have an open recruit. Because if he doesn't have an FTE open, he can't recruit, right? You, you don't want to have you can't be recruited for a position you don't have authority to recruit for. So we left the FTE authority knowing that he would always have a vacancy rate, but not dropping the bar. If that makes sense. Is there anything else you guys want to cover that anything that I need to know that you're not uh, thinking is going to materialize? Yeah, it, 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 it was pretty solid. Okay. All right. Sheriff, sure, are you happy with the budget? Well, I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm happy. I, I mean, if we were to be totally candid, you know, we always need. I mean, we don't always need more, but we can always use more. If, if the day comes that there's some additional uh, cash out there, then, you know, I'd like us to be considered for uh, add some positions. Our workload is extremely heavy. Uh, and I think we, I think if you're to take a tour of the building, that you'll find that, uh, that we're doing a lot of cutting edge uh, stuff to make the county substantially safer. And uh, and uh, you know we're always on the leading edge of a lot of stuff. And, and then we also you know we, our workload is heavy out there. And we get uh, we could use some more investigators. We could use some more folks on the road. Yeah. I mean that's just a big total of cost. But if we don't have the money, we don't have the money, and we have to do what, what we can. Kind of at the level though we have grown to expect, you've got funding to accomplish that. We do at this point, but, you know, we cut those 10 FTEs, and honestly, I wish I had a hold of them. But, I mean, that's, and because in addition to that, that year, we cleaned up that 10 FTEs position, and then I think we, there was 11 other positions throughout the administration that we asked people who could retire, uh, to do, to retire, because it wasn't going to hurt them financially, and it was going to keep a uh, job kind of value for uh, deputies and stuff, but when you do that, and when you're an agency that's as progressive as we are, there's a lot of administrative steps to get through hoops and meetings and steps and all that, and so when you start cutting out like that, then it takes longer to try and accomplish your mission. There are people that are working around the clock to try and get done. Well, one thing, I think you guys noticed, but, you know, when we went through the last arbitration and we provided those 66 layoff notices, those were in anticipation of losing the arbitration. And we said if we prevailed in the arbitration, we could withdraw those. The reason why we issued those was because we're required by the contract to give a certain amount of notice. And because people have the right to exercise bumping, which can take several months based on the timelines that are provided. 
if we hadn't provided the notice and waited until the arbitrator ruled and we didn't prevail, then we would have had to cut a whole lot more than 66. So we put in motion so that if the timing required the reductions, we would be able to do it. The, there was still a cost to us. When we prevailed, we still had increased costs. And I know that there was you know, a lot of news reports saying that you know, the union didn't get a raise. There were more than 50, almost 60% of the employees that were still in 5% per year step, increase, uh, step increases. They did, were provided a coal in one of those three years. We did increase contributions to their medical insurance. So to cover that cost, and so that the sheriff didn't lose any deputies on the street, he took all of that out of administration. He cut under sheriffs, captains, lieutenants. And so when he's saying that you know he's light on administration, it's probably the lowest level of administration that he's had in his office since I've been here. And he did that in order to make sure that none of the deputies lost their job, even though you know both the sheriff and I took quite a beating because we issued layoff notices in anticipation of being able to deal with the impacts should we not prevail. There were still impacts, and you know, uh, they were all taken in, in administration. So, in order to pay for those costs, and you know, essentially, I'm telling you that because we could be in a similar position this time because we're getting ready to start another arbitration or negotiation at this point that's subject to arbitration. What do you think of a patrol deputy, assuming he's got a car? What does it cost us per deputy? Well, I mean, you know, budgeted probably about a hundred, hundred thousand a year. Uh, if if you if you look at total employer cost of compensation, so post employment benefits, so they still cost us money when they're not our employee. I mean, whether because they're on workers' comp because they're injured, or whether it's because they're on unemployment because we laid them off, or whether it's because they're actually drawing a retirement, and you know, we're required by law to provide access to our health plan. We don't pay for a retirement health plan, but we have to provide, and therefore we take the risk of the cost of that health plan when an employee chooses to buy. They can go buy their own insurance somewhere else. I mean, then you're you're talking several tens of thousands of dollars. Now. And if you want an exact amount, I'd have to actually do a work. No, I mean, just you know, usually uh, just the wages alone are probably what seventy thousand a year. You're going to pay a hundred to hundred and forty thousand dollars for, it. and I think as your cost that you wanted to, uh, that you just yeah. specified is the car the included. Car. Yeah. Yes. Take the big, uh, cost of wages and, and benefits and, and the car and those right. direct costs associated with the patrol deputy. You're probably what one hundred and fifty thousand. I would say that's a safe number. Yes. Let, let me let me let me actually. That's a safe number, probably not assuming a lot of overtime and comp time, because we just went through arbitration. Um, we had a public records request wanting to know uh, the top 10 paid deputies and the, top, and the bottom paid 10 deputies. And I think the bottom range was 55, 60,000. The top range, and this is just salary, I'm not talking about anything else, was pushing near 150,000 with overtime. So, and that was, a, that was a corrections deputy in the jail. So when you include overtime and comp time and all those things that people work when they have to, you know, stay over because someone didn't come in for their shift, or you have to follow certain collective bargaining requirements, uh, and, and all other incentives. So we pay incentives for people that speak Spanish. If you're bilingual, then you get a certain premium, and if you do certain activities, you get a certain premium. Those are things that we're subject to because of collective bargaining, not arbitrarily do we pay them. I feel like I stepped in to ask a delicate question and I didn't mean it that way. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, you know, it just it depends on what position you're talking about. I would just a general information. Kind well, of there's... Yeah. Yeah. I don't want to get into any bargaining or any, any detail at all. I'm just well, there's just things that drive that. And is it, it isn't that important, so we can move on. All right, well, good, because we're on the next budget. <laughs> so, okay. thanks, you guys. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. They are in the final budget in the budget binder. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
usually get it, but this is just, this isn't prepared for when it gets delivered to you. I know, I see we've got one by one. Yeah, just the I'd be interested to know that Sue, who is the sheriff's uh, budget person, actually came from Josephine County. And she said that she, uh, as, as, as difficult as it is to put the budget together, she wanted me to know how much she appreciates our budget process here. And I bet you can imagine why. Um, so let me start with uh, council. We, this is Joel Benton. He is our interim county council, um, previously a senior uh, assistant county council. Uh, our county council retired. We also had one of our staff who left for private sector employment, so we have two attorneys in our, actually, what was a five-person attorney office that we were running with four attorneys in it, reduced uh, last year, uh, one of the FTEs. Um, Joel became interim uh, March 1st. March 1st. And so I, we're, I'm going to help him through this budget uh, process here. Um, and, uh, you know, in terms of the general fund contribution, council isn't a big consumer of general fund. They're an indirect cost department. Essentially, all departments pay for the services they receive. And uh, the budget, budget amount they had from the general fund last year was 152997 and this year is 147806 So also a slight reduction in the cost of the general fund. Also a reduction generally across all departments uh, in terms of uh, the county council's budget. We don't have any changes in FTE, but we're in the middle of recruiting uh, significantly for both the county council and the uh, assistant county council positions. Interestingly enough, we did post what is our entry level uh, council position in, um, which we withdrawn that posting, but we received 80 applications for it, which is a fairly significant, really, for, for that type of a position for attorneys. The reason why we receive that many applications for that specific job is it really is an entry-level job for people coming right out of law school who may have clerked and have no experience whatsoever. So they're here to learn the ropes, to provide uh, research and uh, almost uh, legal assistance type work and be developed uh, into attorneys. So, but still, uh, a good thing for us that we were able to recruit uh, that much. The total county county uh, budget for last year was $878,696 and this year it's $862,249, so another uh, reduction <coughs> overall. Um, we. We'll cover this, you know, typically in the budget hearings, not usually in here, but I will tell you that the cost of our county council is a bargain as compared to us going out and hiring the private sector. We're around $100, maybe slightly less an hour. Uh, if we go out and hire someone here locally, we're about two to 250 and if we go to Portland, we're up near $500 an hour. So the spreading the legal costs internally with the council department is much less expensive. We've also been able to significantly reduce our external costs for council, a lot due to Joel, who has uh, some specialty in land use and employment law. In fact, we I don't think we've contracted <coughs> out anything regarding uh, employment law where we used to essentially have a multi-million dollar contract with Bullard Law Firm in Portland. So we have saved a lot of money bringing as much of it as we can in-house. It's difficult to do because it is specialized area of law. Most people that specialize in employment law can go make uh, two or three hundred thousand dollars a year as an attorney instead of uh, eighty thousand dollars a year as a county attorney. So um, we certainly have appreciated 
uh, Joel in our council's office for that. I honestly have to tell you that I don't have, I mean, this is a pretty status quo budget. The costs have gone down. The, the issue with their budget really is the transition. And we are going to see some contracting for outside services while we're bringing staff on because we can't do all of the work here that we need to. Do you want to add anything? Um, I, I don't. Um, we do have some reductions um, from last year's budget, um, partly to reflect the reduction in the um, general fund contribution, um, which is a, a minority of our budget, but which then um, causes sort of a reduction. And most of the reductions um, relate in, relate to a reduction in how much was budgeted for uh, outside legal expenses um, because of the time and development of the budget. We had four attorneys who had been here for a while, and so. Um, the budget was developed with the sense that we were going to have less outside legal expenses than we had in the past, and so that's where the majority of this budget developed um, reduction is in. Does anybody has any questions? Uh, yeah, you can help me on this. I, I'm having a hard time finding where the actual uh, contracted out services were, I mean, for outside counsel. Uh, what page well, we don't list by contract. The services. I mean, would we have a total? Uh, we, we we have an amount we budget, but let me let me caution you on that. As Joel just said, that amount that we budgeted, they expected that we had all four attorneys that were working for us, and that we would minimize the amount of outside contracted services. We're not changing that in the budget because what we do is we have FTE budgeted that have revenues and expenditures tied to them. When they're not filled, we'll use those revenues and expenditures that we would have spent there in contracted services. And like I said, because it's a transition, I don't know whether we'll have county council hired in a month or not, or six months, and I don't know, you know how long it will take us to fill the position. So you can look, and Joel just pointed out, um, it's on, which page, Joel? It's page three, about half one down. Uh, it's line, it's object number 64104225, called legal services. Oh, legal services. Okay, all right, okay, that's what I'll look And that's... And, and there's also contracted contract. services. Contracted services. Contract services as well. Yeah. But we will likely, right now, spend more, you know, but this is next year's budget. Sure. But what I'm telling you is, while we have, you know, a, two vacancies in their office and we're not spending the per costs associated with personnel, those savings go towards contracting outside services. They won't reflect in the budget. They'll reflect, you know, essentially in the comprehensive annual financial report, which is our balance sheet and our income statement when we account for the budget. But the uh, best guess scenario at the time of putting the budget together. Well, well I was just looking for our history. Yeah. We actually, when we went over the indirect costs, and I can get this for you, we did uh, have a presentation by then County Council Rick Whitlock to all the departments to that showed the representation of reduction in cost in outside uh, council, especially with regard to the employment litigation. I mean, it was a lot. And it's not just litigation like employees suing the county or the county suing employees. It also has to do with collective bargaining because we used to use outside council for mm -hmm. negotiating when we had three contract, three collective bargaining units in the county. So we would have to pay someone to travel from Portland to pay for their cost of being here, the contracted cost of their hourly rates, all of the work they would do, you know, back at the office, and those are all now internal and included in the overall cost of county council's office, so, and, but, you know, I can get you more specific numbers, John, if yeah. you wouldn't be something I have to write this, you know. Anything else you want to add, Joe? Okay. Anybody have any other? Thank you, just want to know if you know the I've said it some, but um, names. Uh, <laughs> April 7th. April 7th. Nice to meet you. Dick Bruce. So. Greg Morris. Nice to meet you. If you want to introduce yourself. Then. Yeah, and I'm, I'm Joel Bettman. I'm uh, currently serving as the interim county council. I've been with the county since uh, January of 2011, and I was originally hired as a senior assistant county council um, to bring in the, the employment and labor law into the in-house. And so, um, if you have any questions, I can answer them. You can tell them a little bit about what you did before that if you want. It's not okay. an interview, but thank you. Okay. <laughs> uh, before that, I, I, I lived, I, I, I practiced for about 10 years in the state of Nevada. Um, five years previous to coming here, I was, I did essentially the same job for Carson City, Nevada, um, with their, their district attorney's office. 
Um, and then prior to that, I spent five years with the Nevada legislature working and drafting on um, government and business related legislation. Do you have any questions? Thank you everyone for your time. Thank you. Nice to meet you. I'm going to go ahead and jump into the library budget. Uh, Lisa's not going to do that today. Essentially with the library, we had a lot of discussions about this. Uh, this will be something I'm sure you'll deliberate on when we get to your uh, budget hearings. So I want to avoid deliberating on it today. But I do want to say, you know, we have a contractual agreement with a private company to run the libraries. That contract requires a 3% annual uh, CPI adjustment, which typically is less than the annual growth of the county costs. Um, but like last year, this year we only provided a 1%, we provided something less than the 3% contractual requirement in the budget adjustment. So we asked the library to you know, provide the same 1% increase um, that we had provided every other general fund department but they have a 3% increase in the contractual requirements. The difference for that, like last year, is coming out of the uh, materials budget, essentially books, purchases, and that kind of stuff. Now, I will say, I don't know that that necessarily is going to mean a reduction in purchasing of those things because they've been able to access other funds outside of the county budget process, library foundation, and friends of libraries groups to help fill that void. To what degree, I can't say right now in this budget, but um, I do want you to know that as I propose, you know, essentially we would provide for a status quo budget for the libraries, not based on the library district tax rate that may or may not pass, um, but so that we have a budget that if the district does pass, we have uh, the ability with the district's concurrence, and I'm assuming that the district will want to continue to work with the county until they're up and running and can take on the responsibility themselves, to uh, be able to certify the tax rolls, which is required to be done by July 1st, which highly unlikely the district would be in a position to develop their own budget, uh, meet all of the requirements for the budget process, and certify a tax themselves to issue. So it really is a placeholder the budget committee did in de December deliberate that if the levy or the district doesn't pass that you would reconvene following that to discuss whether or not you wanted to continue with this. I have said that I am proposing this is an annual budget regardless of whether the district passes or not and I propose that because of the growth in our uh, what our uh, rainy day fund would be because of circumstances that happened this year that were beneficial for the county. I did go over all of those with you and explain those in the December meeting. I will go over all of those with you and explain them again when we get to the budget part where you deliberate so you have all of that information. There are not a lot of, there, there was a, a proposal for a capital project for an improvement to the Medford Library. We have some garage doors that were glass that people have busted out and they wanted to replace those with non-glass doors. Um, however, because we're facing a district and want to wait to see if that happens, we'll hold off on any capital improvements until we figure out what we're going to do. Uh, but other than that, there's not really anything else in the library budget. It's, it's pretty much status quo. 
with the same 1% um, adjustment that everyone else has. And those are the circumstances. Why for those, I think the only one that wasn't here was Craig when we discussed that. Were you, were you here? No, I think so. Yeah. So for everyone else, uh, you have a lot more background. And Craig, if you want to meet offline and get me catch up, I don't mind doing that, but I'd rather not do it yeah. here again. Yeah. Um, so do you guys have any questions about that? Oh. Yeah, I'll let Harvey cover the law library. Thank you. Just, just a quick one on the law library. Uh, basically, if you've ever had a chance to visit the law library, it's downstairs underneath the courts. And uh, we're pretty much required to do that. The state provides the funding for it. Um, but the amount of funding that the state is providing is actually slide backwards. We did develop a pretty good size fund balance in there, so we are using the fund balance to keep our materials uh, budget up. So just a, a heads up, that is, you know, we're, we're sliding backwards on that. And it, there will come a point, we've probably got another you know, three years or so, um, where it really can push a company show. But uh, you know, for now, we're just scooping along. There was a movement uh, in the legislature uh, last year to actually the state was looking to kind of take those over and trying to do a, a more of a regionalized thing so they would have the revenue but then they would have the, the service as well uh, but that fell apart you know, at the last minute so we're still getting that revenue all of it's reduced i think the reason why the state wanted to do it just so you understand is that most law libraries carry a fund balance and I think the state saw it as a way to pull money into the general fund for the state. Um, <coughs> right, Craig, you understand that. I do. Yeah. So, uh, but as Harvey said, the East, correct, it is declining. There's significant declining. <coughs> there is a lot of people are uh, staying in their offices and they're using the online services. So we, we do provide those online services and online access to it. But it's not a, a comprehensive, as comprehensive as the library itself. So we do have hard copies of materials in there that you can't necessarily get easily on. But if you look at the cost per patron, um, we're spending in the vicinity of $450 per person to visit the library. So it is very expensive. Not per citizen. But per user. Per user. Per, yeah. user. Yeah. per person who wanders in. That doesn't include, I don't think, uh, the materials provided to the jail because they're not wandering in. So, I mean, really, <laughs> the, yeah, yeah. really, I mean, that's the, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the main, well, that's the main legal requirement of having a law library is to serve, you know, <clears throat> provide access to those legal materials for inmates. So, are the, are the inmates aren't included in that program? They didn't walk in. Uh, the, the, the stuff gets delivered to them, but I mean, that's really. They order it and then you take it to the jail? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then we're, on, we're I mean, yeah. And then on the mail courier service, um, they're the ones who go from the mail from the internal offices. So when we send something to somebody else, we put it in the county office and it goes. Um, we actually. It's, it's a pretty effective system just because uh, you know, they, they're able to meter our mail and so they you know, actually are able to watch the things in the press. Uh, so we do uh, realize some efficiencies there. The budget here is down just a little bit uh, because we were able to uh, last year or this year we purchased a mail meter system and uh, so we don't have that expense. So that's a, that's a person and a half. So the one person basically takes the, the bulk of the, the services and then a half time fills in one million the other one. Pretty minimal service for this one. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. you feel complete now, Mark? I feel complete. All right. <laughs> We, uh, we have a little break. Hopefully everyone remembers Shannon Bell, who's our finance director mm -hmm. slash treasurer. <laughs> and uh, 
Uh, I'm going to let Shannon explain this, but we did have a one FTE increase uh, in her budget, which was a transfer from one department to her department, and, which I think was a really good move. Actually, it was her suggestion, and we worked with uh, our elected county assessor to make that happen. Um, other than that, pretty much, you know, every year since Shannon's been here, you've seen incremental reductions in costs uh, in her budget, and she's done all sorts of things to make the department more efficient. She can touch on a couple of things that she's worked on this year to do that. Obviously, finance also is one of those departments that is not a huge consumer of um, general fund, um, but it does include the uh, property management payment center, accounting, and treasurer. So uh, she came in on her budget target, and um, as I said, there's an increase in her budget target because of that transfer of the FTE. So you want to maybe talk about that a little, Shannon? Sure. So we have a program with for the senior deferral and veterans exemptions. And so if you are a senior and you meet certain criteria, you can have your taxes deferred and it's this um, or Department of Revenue program. And then if you're a veteran, you get a veterans accept exemption off of your taxes. So both of those lower your payment amounts. And so during tax season, I kept seeing a lot of seniors coming to our window and they would ask about the program or they'd ask if they were on the program. And we kept sending them up three flights of stairs the building, you know, to the assessor's building. And then it, it finally occurred to me, well, this is kind of more of a payment issue because of the deferral of your payment rather than an assessment issue. So what would we think about moving the program down to our department? And so we moved the one FTE that runs that program, Jennifer and Reinter, into the tax department. And so we went through this last tax year with the seniors just being able to come to the window. And we have actually a special window down at the end that's it's ADA compliant, so there's a chair, and you can sit there and, and, and she can talk to the seniors. And it was actually a really great move. We got a lot of good feedback from the citizens not having to go up to the third floor. And then come back down. And then come back down. Like they go up and find out something, and they have to come back down and pay their taxes. So it's all done in one spot. So and actually, a couple other counties are looking at Hmm. So. Anything else you want to talk about in here, Shannon? Um, I don't know, unless anybody has any questions. Charge backs for accounting and treasury are both down. Um, purchase card rebate up about $10,000. Shannon's worked really hard, and we've pushed departments and directors and staff that use the purchasing card to <clears throat> move to using the purchasing card because we get the money. Back and we do have very strict and tight controls, including supervisory review and approval of every purchasing card, the every user's purchasing card, prior to making payment for the charges incurred. And we do kind of continually audit ourselves uh, with regard to that. We have limits set on purchasing cards. There are exceptions to those limits depending. There can be one-time exceptions if someone's going to make a large purchase that's approved either by authority of the Board of Commissioners by purchase order by myself or Harvey. And uh, that requires a request and a one-time exception essentially is set up on the purchasing card. Some people's limits are higher than others because they may do all the purchasing in the department as opposed to you know needing a purchasing card to go on a training once or twice a year. So there's a whole kind of range. But it's been it's been really good. You want to talk about banking services and all that a little bit? Sure. We have a um, RFP for banking services. Yeah, it's actually due today, four o'clock. Mm -hmm. uh, we have five banks that are intending to bid on that. We've received three RFPs so far. So, How's the portfolio doing? Portfolio is about um, one thirty. You know. Yeah, right. <laughs> Pretty anemic. Well, <laughs> yeah, well. It's better than the point five. It's, it's, it's yeah, right. <laughs> two and a half times the pool. Yeah. 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 One of the, uh, yeah. Yeah. Agencies yeah. That yeah. Paper yeah. Situation. yeah. 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 Yeah.
and may require more detail than I can answer, is when we took on the capital construction project over here, we were solicited by one of our local banks for a very low interest credit line, essentially, at 1%. And as opposed to pulling out investments where we're earning more than 1%, in other words, losing that increment of income, we chose to uh, take a credit line of $8 million, we did the first time, $8 million. And it was at 1%, and there were no loan fees. It's not subject to arbitrage because it's not bonded. It's not going to a financial advice. So we actually are allowed to retain the interest earnings. Um, and we received the money immediately, even though we weren't spending it. So we took it and, and invested it, and we'll pay it out as we, so, so we did more than just not lose the increment of income. We gained an increment of income by interest earnings as well. Um, what I asked Shannon to do, because <clears throat> that's a really good deal for us, is to look at what our, our limits are on being able to take those credit lines. And um, we're allowed annually uh, to uh, borrow up to $10 million against our total debt limit, which is $213 million. We wouldn't want to borrow $213 million, and I'm not suggesting that to you at all. What I'm saying is, you have discussed, and we're going to bring this to the Board of Commissioners here pretty soon for a discussion, but just so you have this in your mind, the other capital project needs that we still have, one is the Justice Court, which we're in the process of trying to identify uh, property and um, develop, which you know probably is a million dollar project at the most. Um, and we carry a million dollars in fund balance, we could pay cash for it, but we can keep that million dollars invested and earn a higher rate of return than we can by borrowing money and paying it back. We get a five year, uh, it's a five year line, right? So, and you, you know, the way that interest rates are going or not, they're stabilizing and we could see an increase in that. Um, and so um, our, our duration on our portfolio is two. We invest you know, up to five years. So, um, if we have a five-year credit line, our durations too. You can see we could gain even more interest earnings over the period of a five-year credit line. So, when we're talking about the capital projects, the other one that is on everyone's mind is the district attorney's office. Once again, it could be probably about a five million dollars, six million, four million, somewhere in that range. The old project, as opposed to once again, pulling it out of fund balance and removing it from something that's earning more interest, we do have that available to us. Frankly, to me, it makes sense even for operating expenses to go borrow the $10 million and pay it back during the year because we're still going to earn an increment of interest no matter what. Um, but that's a discussion I'll have with the board. Um, people know if you can borrow money at 1% and earn 2% interest, it makes no sense not to borrow money. So, well. Some people are against borrowing money altogether, but when we have the money in the bank to pay the loan back, we're not borrowing on anticipated revenues. We actually have fund balance, then it makes no sense to me not to do it. So, and anything you want to add to that the details? Or any, you, if you guys have any questions, Shannon's. I would, I would just say I think it makes a lot of sense to look at it that way, but I would, I would recommend that the commissioners establish a policy around borrowing that's pretty clear. I mean, that you can go to them for exceptions, but I, I would really recommend policy that is pretty specific about what the borrowing limits are, the amount of debt, et cetera. I would, I would panic if we started borrowing just yeah. because a lot of them. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think we would approve it either. Yeah, right. Yeah. But, you know, I, I still think it's a good idea because you never know what set of commissioners are going to be That's sitting right. here in the right. way to. Right. Uh, we've seen other counties and governments run away with borrowing. That's right. I'd sure like to see a tight policy on that. Mm -hmm. Well, what I think is good is, you know, because we're not borrowing against anticipated revenue, like that's what the state does. They go and issue $100 million in bonds against future lottery proceeds. We're borrowing against money we have in the bank. Mm -hmm. And so if we were to set aside an unappropriated balance against what we borrowed each year as a budget item, but leave the money invested, then we're really technically not going in debt. We're servicing the debt at the time. We're taking the debt by budget authority, if, if you get what I'm saying. Well, I get what you're saying. It's a little bit of smoke and mirrors, but I mean, debt is debt. Sure. You know, it's a, sure. <laughs> but, yeah, right. but as long as you have, 
if you if you've identified and earmarked the money to pay I, that debt. I, I understand. And if you've restricted that, cash, right? That's why I said unappropriate. I get it. And you have to restrict it, and it have to be tied as collateral. On you. But still, debt is debt on your balance sheet. Yeah. The, the actual credit end. line does require us to pledge the full faith and credit, right. so it is collateralized against the general Yeah, right. But, you know, debt is debt on your balance sheet, and the amount of debt could impact your bond ratings for future borrowings and et cetera. But yeah, I think some policy is appropriate. Yeah, yeah. that's mm -hmm. all. And we certainly do have policies. I'm not mm -hmm. sure that it covers this, because yeah. I don't think yeah. we anticipated that. Yeah. Although, yeah. This right. Although paying yeah. off debt in one year makes it a current asset. Mm -hmm. Probably. Yeah, there's a difference between the expenditure and revenue and the asset and liability, but you're right. right. But but even if you intend to pay it off in the current year, if you're borrowing it on a five-year basis, it, it, so it's going to show up yeah, on your balance sheet. The minute you put so, in, you can pay it off in five years, and you're in the yeah. long term. Right. I'm, I'm not arguing with doing it. I think it's a great idea. I'm just I agree. Are you paying it off? Parameters and policy. That's an issue. On this, we're paying it off over the five years. Yeah, five years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for, for the building we took over here. Although, it was a budgeted expenditure in the budget. So, we've right. accounted for the cost of it. We're not floating the credit line is what I'm saying. We're actually, the money's budgeted to pay the credit line. Right. It's just right. we're not having to pull it out of investments and lose that increment. And in this case, which was great, we took the money right away and put it in investments. So, we didn't just lose the increment that we would have lost by cashing out our investment. We also enhanced the amount of the value of that uh, credit loan, assuming that inflation doesn't outweigh that investment. Sure. Sure. Yeah, so what we did is we actually took the money from the general fund transfer to the capital project, so we didn't intend to fund the project, and then when we sold for one we got the bond, the loan, then we put that in the general fund, the whole thing, to reimburse the general fund for the transfer, and then so we got that money sitting there, and then we were paying that, using that money. Yeah, I didn't mean to get way off the course. I just wanted to, because you guys in the December meeting brought up the, I think Dick, you know, that's the one you weren't here, but Dick brought up the and Don's talked to me about it. You know, it's a, it's an issue, so I just want you to be aware yeah, of it. I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of a, I think we are it's an option that we haven't really forward. had in the past because, you know, frankly, these banks are carrying so much capital when they... They're mining out. Yeah. 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 I mean, we're good credit. And sure. Anyway, on your department, uh, I'm a little slow catching up. You, you have one FTE added over last year. Yes. And so we'll see at least one reduction in the assessor's office. You'll see more than one, but yeah. One of them is the one, one I took. One of them will be the one you took. It's really not an adding, it's a transferring of an FTE. I, I, just mm -hmm. I, I did want to say, and this probably doesn't have much to do with the finance yeah, budget, with the but I, I did explain this when we went over um, the budget targets. You know, the total general fund including the use of the reserve last year after you made the adjustments was forty three million six hundred thousand. This year we're at uh, forty two million twenty six thousand. So almost a million and a half reduction in our general fund budget across all the departments from last year. I mean that's that's the first time that's happened in a long time. And that's with using five point three roughly million in reserves last year we were at seven we started at seven point two you knocked it back and that's funding all the services that were cut at that five point three so now this is this is a joke but that's been hardly not sandbagging these budgets all the time. <laughs> <laughs> okay Shannon <we're> And maybe there is an error key, but I'm just curious why on the mail courier it would have gone from 2400 to 15000 <laughs> Okay, so we brought our um, tax payment processing in-house. Okay. So the way that the mail courier does their chargebacks is by pieces of mail. And so if all of a sudden I have 70000 payments coming in, um, they're charging us an arm and a leg. So we're actually changing processes was changed actually right away and we're having staff go to the post office and pick up the mail instead of the mail courier oh, okay. dealing with it because it's too expensive. Okay. We're still saving money overall over lockbox, but I don't, okay. I have to save every penny I can. Uh, also <laughs> you had about a 25% increase in county council charges. You know, yes, that's um, in property management due to foreclosures. 
the foreclosed homes. Uh, we had one house um, that was basically a meth house that nice. is expensive. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. Um, well, I guess we're to the next budget. But one, one of the things I want to tell you, too, because we're always focused on the general fund, and those are the budget targets you set. And I talked about the reduction of about a million and a half from last year. The other thing that's helped all these budgets that's inclusive of the general fund, but the majority is dedicated funds, is the overall charges for indirect costs across all the departments went down a million dollars as well. So while the amount of general fund we're giving departments, we were able to do some million and a half, the cost impact to them across all funds for those indirect charges is down a million dollars. That's things like reduction in cost for finance and IT and council. And the biggest con contributor to that was our risk reduction or redu reduction in our risk and that was because we maximized the, uh, the reserve and, and, and didn't charge that out so I just want you to know that these costs are going down significantly they probably won't be as significant next year because we had the purge this year and we're doing this is the second year in a row we've done no cost of living adjustments so no raises but uh, let's see How's everyone this year? Good. How are you doing? Good. Doing great. So, this is uh, one of those Chris Walker restaurants. And uh, we essentially have um, clerk's administration, elections, and recording uh, in the clerk's budget. Um, we're uh, essentially a status quo. Um, budget here. I will tell you that, as you know, when Chris first came on, we did a significant performance audit on the department, and Chris made a lot of reductions in FTE, a lot of restructuring and how the workload was managed, and created a whole lot of efficiency. She's done an amazing job with that. But we've continued to do follow-up audits to make sure we're matching the staffing levels with the workload. We don't want them to get overwhelmed and overran. You'll see this in the clerk's budget, uh, the surveyor's budget development services and um, assessment that the you know uh, real estate market is picking up. We have more permit applications, more filing of subdivisions and plats, and when those things happen, all that gets recorded. So there's an increase in workload in the recording uh, recordings, recorder's office. Plus, <coughs> as you know, obviously Chris is dealing with an election coming up and also we'll deal with the uh, November election and any other special elections that might occur. So, um, with that said, even though it's a status quo budget, we have periodically came back to the Board of Commissioners to either have minor reductions in FTE when we lost work or minor increases in FTE. And just want to qualify our budget by saying when that happens, that's not funded out of the general fund, it's funded out of the recording fees. And it, while it while it assists the general fund because those fees go to the general fund, we don't want to do it at the expense of not providing an adequate level of service. So sometimes we have to spend money to keep the staffing levels up, and we're watching that uh, really closely. I don't have any uh, well any issues that Chris and I have already talked about with the budget. We worked in terms of the recommended budget, and then the budget I'll be bringing to you. So I don't have a lot to say between those programs. I'll give Chris a chance if there's anything you want to add talk about in there. Appreciate the support you guys give us and of course all of the staff from the administrative office, the auditors, the, um, I mean we all work together, we're a team, so thank you. Tell us about FTEs, total, same as last year? Yes, uh, 8.6 was our, yes, I, we have them split a little different um, just between the departments because we're cross training and stuff like that, so yeah. Yeah, she's at 8.6 still, so that's well. We did allow uh, the clerk to carry over some money that they had from the prior year and we had to remodel the offices upstairs in the elections building. So if you're interested to go see how that turned out. Any issues with equipment like we talked about in the past, election machines or <laughs> uh, well we did benefit uh, from the it was a two hundred and thirty eight thousand dollar purchase from the Secretary of State, so we did get that uh, sorter. Um, uh, from them purchased one hundred percent through HAVA funds to help America vote out, which is money provided by the federal government. Um, and then they did pay one year of maintenance costs for that as well. 
and right now we're in the middle of, of uh, that is already in our office and all that, but uh, we're doing upgrades right now to that because uh, the clerk's asked for a lot of changes to accommodate OCDR, the centralized voter registration, but um, all going well. Um, we, we had a little rub with the state on that. The state yeah. wanted us to buy it, right. and the state commonly kind of makes promises to us, mm -hmm. uh, especially with regard to the clerk's function. I think they, mm -hmm. three or four times I've said that I really don't believe that they're going to do what they say they're going to do and they don't. And we brought it to the board and the board declined to purchase the equipment and then that's when the state decided they would go ahead and purchase it. So I have a more of an operating question, I guess. I'm not supposed to ask if you'll answer it, but with mail ballots, risk of people filling up something erroneously or on purpose, I guess. Do we have a way to, I mean, are you pretty aggressive with purging the voter registration? I'm, I'm not sure I'd ask that question. Could you talk to that a little bit? Well, an investigation would be done because a formal complaint would need to be made, and of course, at our level, we cannot investigate um, or do uh, those complaints. They may come to us, but we'll forward those to the Secretary of State's office and they take a very hard line on the people that are caught cheating in that manner, um, and they do take and prosecute, absolutely. What about you with your, your uh, board of registration? Do you go through those annually or drop people that are... Well, by law, we have a, a purge after every federal election, depending on... There's strict guidelines within the statutes and the OARs that state how we treat those different type of uh, voter registrations, whether they voted in the last so many years. Um, so those are all things that, that, yes, we have a regular schedule and we work directly with the Secretary of State's office with the centralized voter registration uh, to take care of those issues. If somebody dies this year, they automatically get dropped? Uh, we get regular updates from the uh, Department of Human Services when uh, people have passed or deceased. Uh, we will also have notification from uh, a spouse or a family member that they may have. Um, so yes, those are things that we do very regularly. The Secretary of State also runs reports. They work with other agencies, DMV, Health and Human Services, to come up with those. So we get um, uh, we get changes all the time um, concerning not only deceased persons but change of addresses. We work with the postal system on that as well. There's a lot of mechanisms out there. Sure. Are you the final authority, or is the state the authority on dropping something? Well, it's based on laws. It's based, all based on the laws. So, so technically, the state. Mm -hmm. They're state laws. State laws, and you have you're, you're, you have to follow the state law. Then. State and federal, state. exactly. Yeah. I have no decision-making power in that. We follow That's what the law sure. says. I have a question with the uh, and uh, I'll take some base here too on, but. Uh, your, your thoughts on the attempt uh, on move to online voting? Um, you know what, we had a measure that was actually going to go before the legislature and they felt that the timing was bad on that so it never moved forward. Concerning a work group to set up to investigate the option of internet voting. And the way I look at that is whether you agree or disagree with internet voting, it is something that's going to happen in the future, especially with Generation Y, which their first language is cyber and their expectation is to move forward with that. So as clerks, we either completely object to it and don't have a seat at the table when the talks start, or as an elected county clerk, we take and have a seat at that table when that conversation starts, or when it's looked into. And uh, we feel it's very important to have a seat at that table, that, that the security, of course, is always important, that things that we want to see take place when we move forward to that uh, happen. And, and that we have a seat at that table to be able to have a dialogue in that conversation. So it's going to happen whether we want it to or not. Um, so we just want to be informed and we want to be able to have our, uh, our say in what happens as we move forward. Anybody else have any budget questions? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. 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 Thanks for us. Thanks, everyone. Have a yeah. good day. So IT, uh, just real quick, um, and I'll have Mark go over a couple of the, the big projects. We do have a reduction in FTE, mostly associated with uh, the transition from the implementation of what we're going to do with the assessor's office. 
that we're not doing anymore. That will be reflected in the assessor's budget. We were able to negotiate a refund of our uh, payment and um, the equipment we purchased through IT will be used in assessment so we actually have no loss and we'll realize a cost reduction I think of about $1.8 million in the software program we're going to versus the rewrite of the existing uh, software. That's partially reflected in the FT and his budget of supporting, but also in the assessor's budget, which we'll talk about. And actually, the assessor's budget was able to meet their budget target and budget the cost of maintenance without coming for additional revenue. So we, between those two, uh, did really pretty well. There's some big programs that within Mark's budget we're working on. Uh, we've done the Microsoft Office upgrade, working on the integration with the phone system. I'll let him talk a little bit about that. Mostly status quo, although the overall indirect costs, as I said, is part of that total $1 million dollar reduction. We not even here as well. Part of that's because of the reduction in purge costs with the legislative changes and also the risk chargebacks as well. Um, and I'll even maybe talk a little bit about a couple of things. Sure. Um, as as Danny said, it's not a dramatic change from last year. Um, but it is down a little bit because uh, of purge and all the things that Danny mentioned. Uh, as far as projects that were Next year is going to be uh, a bit more mopping up of this year's projects than it is for new projects. Uh, the phone system is going to be uh, in this year except for health, we're going to put a new building down and uh, fix that off there. Um, probably the, the biggest new project we're doing next year is um, we've got a lot of legacy law enforcement data, several, like two older sheriff systems, uh, some DA data and things like that, that are still on that AS400, that really old. Green screen. Yeah, the green screen uh, computer, which is expensive to maintain, and I'm excited that we're finally going to kill it off next year. And, that, and that's the last big thing on there is the law enforcement data. We've gotten rid of um, financial systems not on there anymore. Right now, we're by the end of this fiscal year, we should have wrapped up community justice, uh, animal controls off. So all the major applications are off, and then uh, next year we need to deal with the law enforcement data. Um, and then it's mopping up from some of the projects this year. Um, we're continuing to run a pretty lean staffing model. Um, we don't have spare capacity for unexpected projects, really. So um, that's not a bad thing. It's just something to be aware of is we won't have that elastic capacity to just suddenly start a new project. Um, take a few months to ramp up. But so far, you know, our, our customers internally haven't asked for any big new projects. Nobody sees anything on the horizon. So that's what we're staffed for. Oh, and then the other thing is the replacement of the uh, internet, the public website, the federal so this whole thing as we see. And that's an ongoing project that started already. It'll probably take nine months to a year to complete. Uh, we're basically doing department by department, moving uh, department websites over to an entirely new content management system. And then at the very end, it'll be the, the county court page and the court pages. Um, but already the sheriff and the surveyor and parks are done with the roads next. So we'll just keep checking away. That's not it. So let me just add one thing. This is in context of IT, but also the other indirect cost of, uh, departments. So, so you all know, we don't just arbitrarily decide this is how many staff we need in IT, so we're going to bill everybody for it. What we do is we meet with the department directors, make a proposal, we talk about each of the chargebacks within each of the departments and the needs for the departments to size these, these departments where the, everyone's like, agreeable to what they're paying for because we don't want to just be carrying staff that you know are services that people don't want to have. I mean they're paying for the service. So when Mark talks about you know maintaining minimum staffing levels that, that takes a lot of work on his side. We we have done some things where we you know we mostly like to keep these services centralized, but there are some departments where you know there's so much need for full time support that the staff while they report to Mark are, are dedicated to like health and human services or the airport where it's kind of high IT, high IT and uh, high technical needs. So he's done a good job kind of, I'm going to say, uh, creating a little bit of a hybrid for those areas where they weren't necessarily happy with the service before because they just couldn't get enough of what they needed. And other than that, everyone else can be charged and managed centralized because they don't necessarily require that high level of attention all the time, and uh, he, Mark, certainly deserves credit for uh, doing that. I remember when I first started with the county, and uh, I think Craig was 
is for sure going to get because everyone else knew that one of the biggest issues every budget year was IT. And mm -hmm. what are we paying for? How, why, are, why are we paying for it? Mm -hmm. You don't hear those questions anymore because, uh, you know, when, when I hired Mark, he pretty much uh, provided a pretty detailed explanation of why people get charged and what they're being charged for and, and has sized the, the charges to what they needed. So I think uh, you certainly deserve credit for that. And, you know, obviously, an organization that has 900 FTE, probably 850, well, we're going to be pushing 900 FTE. I know you probably remember we were at 842, and 900 sounds large. That's mostly all human services and all dedicated for them, and we'll explain that when we get there. But other than that, you know, maintaining that much IT infrastructure along with uh, critical systems, emergency, backup, telephones, all that kind of stuff, uh, their staff are pretty likely to do that. What if it's IT and they report to you, even if they're fully dedicated to another? Um, most of them do. Uh, for example, um, I've got a couple of guys who do a lot of work at the airport and the sheriff who's got a lot of specialized security systems, cameras, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and so what happens is those FTEs are collected into a business unit and built just to those two departments according to how much time they spend them. There's uh, one employee who's an IT person, but he's not actually part of IT for services to support maybe mental health. Um, but yeah, it's basically like Danny said, I, I, I use the financial system to collect costs that are really dedicated to a particular customer because that's our chargeback model is we try to collect things directly that we can uh, and then what's left over gets spread universally. So um, there's a lot of applications that are specific to sort of line of business, the VA, the justice, et cetera. And so we actually figure out exactly how much time, how much materials and services, those sorts of things can fairly be said, no, it's just for assessment, and we build just assessment. Uh, things like email, internet access, those are the general and direct costs of the company. It appears over the last, how many years have you been here? You said it in June. Say five years. He was years. the first one I hired. Mm -hmm. Yeah, five years, and not seven, five. We've had a pretty much a steady decline in IT personnel. Flat or it's pretty, pretty flat. It's pretty, pretty mostly flat. flat. It's jumped up or down a couple. Of the first year, actually, I took the action when I terminated his predecessor, and then cut several FTE out of the budget before Mark came. So I did that right up front. So he did. It happened before he got here. So what you're capturing is part of what happened right before he came. And then he's been able to really kind of you know, drop down and then pretty flat. Pretty flat. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and actually, even I would say not necessarily flat, maybe just slightly declining because the increases have been project specific. So they reflect as FTE, but when we add two and a half FTE for a specific IT project and assessment, those are temporary and they're specific to that project. And so I don't, I don't want to, yes, it, yes, it makes it look like it's flat, but they're only for a certain reason and we've cut them when we're done. I'd say that the you know, sort of core staff will just kind of keep the lights on, and that the number has declined a bit. Um, and like I said, but the overall staffing number is you know, right around you know, 28 and 30 every year, and bumps up and down for a more crowded career. Yeah, yeah, as a Tron project, but then you would for that. It's right. Yeah, it didn't bump up that year. <coughs> and, and actually, even with that, I mean, I give Mark credit, he didn't, just because we had the positions, he didn't fill them. Like, one of them ended up never being filled, and then the rest were reduced as soon as we were deciding we were done with it. So he's, uh, position control with IT has been very strong. Um, you know, you ask the question about the Sheriff's Department, when you have 160, or, you know, it's two, 200 at some point, FT in the budget, it's a little more difficult to be that tight as Mark's been, but he's got the right number to be able to manage it very tightly. And that, that reflects in everybody's chargebacks. I mean, I know that you used to hear, because I used to be a department head and I used to be one of the ones complaining about the chargebacks, you know, that, hey, we're all making adjustments, but you're discharging us the chargebacks. And you'll see, and maybe a question you should ask if you, if you want to, is the department heads are, are happy with the services they're getting. And you don't hear the complaints, even you used to probably hear them more from elected officials than you did from department heads. Uh, you, you don't hear that because you know, we've taken strong action to make sure we're sizing those 
services to the needs of the department rather than just what we think they should be. Who's your three biggest IT users? Uh, well, it, it aligns roughly along uh, FTD, so uh, Health and Human Services, Sheriff, um, and Justice, probably. Uh, the biggest three. Um, but, you know, it, it, it's a bit lopsided depending on the kinds of systems they have. For example, um, assessment tends to spend more per capita, if you will, just because they have some pretty big systems that taxation system that consumes more, more resources than some of the other things do. Um, some departments, mostly small departments, that audit. They're only used much with these email and processing, and that's about it. So, um, a lot of it depends on what kind of specialized line of business systems we have in place for them, but otherwise it's it's a good who has the most employees. It's kind of interesting. Health and human services and uh, safety are a big priority. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you said that, because when we get to the Health and Human Services bill, we're going to see another 50 FTE. Uh, uh, what? <laughs> yeah, no, I'm serious. I hope the state's paying for them. They are. Well, you know, I mean, I don't want to get way off base, but we have projected going from about 19,000 people on Oregon Health Plan to 26,000 when we built this building. But between that and the time we started construction, that's why we added the additional 9,000 square feet. We went from 26 to 27,000 to 36,000. Today, actually on Tuesday, I met with Mark in Jackson County. We now have 50,500 people on Oregon Health Plan. And we had projected 52,000 now by January 1st. So more than 25% of our entire county uh, is on Oregon Health Plan. And all of the responsibilities for serving those people in mental health we have about an 11% penetration rate. So we went from serving you know, 2,000 people to now serving 5,500 people in months. And we're responsible for all of the psychiatric services and the nurse, psychiatric nurse practitioners and the case management and all of that. And it's funded through contracts with CCO. It's not a general fund obligation. We could choose not to do it, which means then the state would do it for us and we would get no input into that. So. You know, considering the circumstances, but yeah, you're going to see a huge increase, and that's why. And other than that, pretty much there's a minor increase or decrease here and there in FTE. And that's a direct result of the state. Yeah, it's the Affordable Care Act, yeah. and you know, it's just it's a lot. And the amount of work that we've gone through this year, and Don's our liaison, he'll, he'll, he'll vouch for me when I say this, it is nonstop, uh, constant, every day severe, this is in addition to managing the capital project over here, this isn't like a, you know, a light job. Harvey and, and Rick and, uh, have done most of the managing of that, but you know, the service element is huge. And uh, you know, you go from 19,000 people to 50,500 people, and it's been less than a year since we adopted the budget last year. So, But even though they're enrolled, they're not all requiring services. They're, they're coming. We went from about, you know, 14 referrals, 15 referrals a month from local practitioners. We're up over 100 referrals per month now. So they're, they're not all getting service, but the amount of workload coming in is astronomical. And they all want, you know, they don't want to see uh, a licensed clinical social worker. They all want to see a psychiatrist or a psychiatric nurse practitioner, which, you know, frankly, we're required to recruit. There's 6,000 psychiatric nurse practitioners in the whole United States. That's it. And so, you know, try to hire one of those. And we need five of them. So anyways, I know that has nothing to do with IT, and I'm sorry, Mark, unless, you know, you want to tie the chain up there. But. Yeah. Does anybody have any other questions for Mark? Just a general question on that subject you just talked about. So say that expands and expands again. I know we transfer costs to health and human services from other departments, but how much strain that isn't uh, transferred in the way of cost does that put on other departments that it takes more and more of their time that you may not really reflect in uh, dollars and cents, but it takes away from mental time, active time, working on other problems. 
Well, while we're understaffed, it takes a lot. When we get fully staffed, it shouldn't be a huge imp impediment that's not funded for other departments. I mean, you know, Mark talked about the, the IT systems. Well, the, the cost of that's going up because there's more to the system and it's funded. But while we're building the capacity, there's a lot of taking Mark's staff time away to build that capacity. And once it's built, and, it's, yeah. and you know, there's examples of that all, you know, all through, through all the departments. Uh, so it, it, it's a lot, it's, it's a huge load that I think most people in our public, I mean, who's paying attention to that right now? I mean, there's more, you know, people are paying attention to other things that are important to them, obviously, but in terms of our workload and, and the biggest things happening in the county, that's probably the biggest thing to be. I mean, everyone sees the, the building. That's and, and frankly, that building was built to serve 26,000 people, not 52,000 people. So, they it already, huh? Isn't that typical? Well, actually, what Clark yeah, Clinic is looking at the legislation part changes the part that down. we're serving. Yeah. Yeah. It, remember, we're not serving all those 52,000 people. No. What I'm telling you is we have a penetration rate of 11% for whatever that number of people is. So. But still, the building was designed to serve 2,700 people, and we've got 5,500 people. So, and we're not done yet. I mean, I don't know where it's going to shake out. My opinion is that most of that capacity was built on the back of the federal waiver that we got in our state for three years to implement this. What's happened in the past, because I've been through cycles of this in my 20 years, is if we don't qualify for another waiver and they haven't figured out a way to cover those costs, they say they're going to cover them by savings in the health system. Personally, I don't believe that's going to happen. Is then they'll they'll uh, tier the system and they'll cut people back. So they'll be they may still be fifty thousand people, but there's only going to be you know twenty five thousand that qualify for mental health <coughs> services, and they'll be tiered. And that's what they've done in the past. So we'll we'll go through this three years of astronomical growth that's unsustainable and, and really very difficult for us to try to manage and serve. To all of a sudden we're cutting everything. And it's not us. It's not the county. You know, it's it's the state and federal government who funds this. It's not a county mandate. The county can choose, as I said, not to do it. But when we choose not to do it, then we have no input or control over the services. And then it just becomes the state telling us what we're doing. So, and the board has kind of taken a pretty strong position about exercising local control whenever we can. Okay. All right, we're done. Thank you, everybody. And we'll see you all, well, some of you, on, on March 17th, 1.30.